Yep. Today what we're doing is celebrating Girls Government Day. And we're here with their teacher, Sherry Carter. And we're here with all the girls that took part in Parkdale High Park's Girl Government uh, for 2017. And they're all from Fern Junior and Senior Public School. We have Catherine Jaworski. We have Mercy Sang. We have Sophie Rashid Cocker. We have Claire Broderick on the panel. And we have Ruby Gore and Hannah Lang here as well, uh, all taking part. And they chose, after debating it and voting by secret ballot, to focus on First Nations health and health care. So girls, take it away. Catherine. My name is Catherine, and I go to Fern Avenue Public School. And I'm here to talk about the lack of health care provided for Aboriginal people in Ontario and across Canada. The physical and mental health of Aboriginal people is important because the health of a family member or friend impacts everyone. Without good health, you have nothing. So if the health care pro being provided is below the standard that is available to all other Canadians, it is the obligation of our government to put practices and policies in place to improve the quality of care. People who live in Aboriginal communities are not getting proper medical health when needed. For example, nurses have told patients to go home, rest, and take Tylenol without fully being assessed by quality trained medical staff. Sadly, patients have passed away of common illness such as strep throat because of lack of thorough health assessments. Most major hospitals can be as far as three hours away and vehicle transportation at times is not possible for some people. Also, the government isn't putting enough funding into environmental health care on reserves to ensure clean, healthy drinking water is available for all First Nations people. If money is being spent to improve health care, why are health care provi providers seeing little improvement? The current standard of care would not be accepted in the pr province systems. Why does the government feel it is sufficient for, all, for our First Nations people? I am encouraging provincial and federal governments to work together to improve medical treatment facilities in Aboriginal communities. It would be beneficial for all the Aboriginal communities to have a doctor or highly trained nurse on call in case em emergency medical help is needed. Equipment and care facilities are, ur are in urgent need of updating, repair, or both. Trained medical practitioners should educate the communities with the tools needed to ensure that the health of each individual is met. This can only be achieved by the help and support of our government. Promises have been made to pr help protect First Nations people and it is simply not being done with respect or dignity. Okay. Hi, my name is Sophie and today I would like to address the differential treatment of Aboriginal health care compared to the rest of the country. Aboriginal health care remains well below the level that other Canadians have come to expect. This problem can be illustrated with the following three areas of differential health care. First of all, clean water is a fundamental to good health, yet there are over 150 drinking water advisories issued across Native Reserves in Canada, posing a threat to one-third of the people living on Native Reserves. The water is contaminated with all sorts of different chemicals, such as uranium or mercury, causing skin infections and conditions, illnesses such as influenza and whooping cough, a lowering of the body's immune system, and an increase in the risk of cancer. This has been an issue on Native Reserves for decades, and only recently has the government devised a five-year plan to fix the water issues. The David Suzuki Foundation also has devised a five-year, um, has identified a, identified a remedy to the problem that has been slowly developing. Contrast this with the Walkerton Clean Water Scandal in 2000, when drinking water was contaminated with E. coli and killed eight people, as well as harming over 2,000 people. The government's response was considerably more timely. By the end of 2004, the water was no longer contaminated and two people had been arrested for keeping the contamination a secret. If the need for clean water on native reserves was addressed with the same urgency as seen in Walkerton, there would be a marked improvement in native health on reserves. Secondly, the level of healthcare resources and trained medical staff on the reserves is distinctly substandard. For instance, a study found that just one in 45 nurses on a reserve had fully completed the government's mandatory training courses. Community leaders have repeatedly complained about their inability to deal with high-risk cases or emergencies in spite of utilizing all their frontline st medical staff. In one case, 
Five-year-old Brody Mikas from a remote res reservation in northwest Ontario died from strep throat, a common bacterial infection that is easily cured. Stories such as Brody's continue on to take place on reserves due to the absence of trained medical professionals and necessary resources found everywhere else in Canada. Until the necessary medical resources are provided, the quality of health care found on reserves will continue to be comparable to a third world level. Finally, the differential stan the standards are also visible in the response to health care crisis. In 1993, disturbing video footage of children as young as 11 sniffing gas and proclaiming that life wasn't worth living surfaced. These children were from Davis Inlet, an escapee native community outside of Labrador. The prior year, no fewer than one quarter of all the adults in Davis Inlet had attempted suicide, and between 1973 and 1995, 50 lives were lost due to alcohol-related deaths in a community of only 465 people. A study done in 2000 showed that 154 of Davis Inlet's 169 youths had inhaled something toxic. And it wasn't until 2002 that the government resolved to finally relocate the community onto the mainland. However, the rampant health care crisis was not solved. Ten years later, substance abuse is still the number one problem on the reserve, and many children are still chronic gas sniffers. In contrast, look at the fentanyl epidemic in Vancouver right now. This crisis has been met with immediate action including the government's allocation of $16 million, as well as the creation of 50 new intensive outpatient treatment services. The federal government has also announced expedited approval for additional safe injection sites across injection sites. If the crisis in, David Inlet, in Davis Inlet had been met with the same urgency, the level of Native community health would have improved far beyond its current levels. It is only when the divide between native and non-native levels of health care are bridged, including all three areas that I have highlighted today, will the Indigenous people of Canada truly be able to live long and healthy lives. Hi, my name is Claire Broderick. I go to Fern Public School and I am a part of Girls' Government. I am extremely concerned at the quality of First Nations health care. I believe there is not enough funding being spread around in First Nations. People think we are giving First Nations plenty of money, when really they have greater need for funding in comparison to us for multiple reasons. First Nations communities are more remote than our own, making it harder and more expensive to send people and equipment to these communities. Many of these communities are fly-in only, so access is limited. These communities also have lower standards of health care, so it becomes more expensive to increase the quality of health care and health care services. There are many other gaps in First Nations health care where funding is needed. For example, a new policy was made allowing First Nations women to bring someone with them when they give birth off reserve. This is telling us that there is inadequate services <laughs> there is inadequate services on reserve because First Nations mothers are unable to give birth in their own communities. Providing the equipment and doctors to give birth would be expensive yet needed. Another example of insufficient funding would be on September 11, 2016 when a young boy broke his arm and because his community didn't have a functioning x-ray, he had to wait two days before anyone could treat him. His community didn't even have enough funding to replace their broken equipment and help their own people. If there was a higher standard of health care in First Nations communities, the communities would be able to provide more for themselves. For example, providing early health care for, for infants and children can highly affect how children grow up and how they function. If there is enough funding for early parenting programs, there would be a lower rate of stress and psychological issues in children. Psychological issues are some of the worst issues for children in First Nations communities, as suicide rates for Aboriginal youth are 5-7% to higher than non-Aboriginal youth. If we were to provide the specialists and programs to support this issue, hopefully the statistics would get lower. These are some of the reasons as to why we should be providing more funding for First Nations health care. Hi, my name is Mercy and I'm here today to talk to you about the mental health of the Aboriginals. Mental illness is one of today's rising issues. We are paying more attention to it than before. Mental health is just as important as physical health, if not more. One in three Canadians suffer from mental illness at least once in their lifetime. Youths are especially vulnerable to the serious threat of mental illness, which includes hidden challenges and suffering alone in silence. In some cases, it also leads to suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for Canadians aged 10 to 24. 
It's evident that many Canadians are severely affected by mental illness. However, the ind Indigenous people of Canada suffer at an even higher level from mental illness than non-Indigenous Canadians. Suicide rates for Indigenous youth are five to seven times higher than for non-Indigenous youth. For any Inuit youth, the suicide rate is 11 times the national average. Furthermore, more than one in five Indigenous and Inuit adults reported having suicidal thoughts at least some point, at some point in their lives. Indigenous people have less help available when dealing with mental illness, causing them to suffer more and stops them from living their lives to the fullest. If I or any of my peers here today were suffering from mental illness, we would be able to get help immediately. We are very fortunate we have a guidance counselor, specialists who come in and talk to us about mental health and give us advice on dealing with mental illness, and we also have readily available therapists and psychologists. Unfortunately, this is not the case for the Indigenous population and it needs to change. Why shouldn't we all have the same help available when we live in the same country? Adolescence is a confusing and challenging time. We feel pressure and stress from schoolwork, social groups, and sometimes from family life. And quite often, we feel the pressure and stress overwhelming and we give up and take our own lives. It doesn't have to be this way though. With the right help and support, we can overcome mental illness and live our lives to the fullest. The Indigenous people of Canada need more help available when dealing with mental illness. They need to have the same services and help that we have to lower their suicide rates and to create more futures. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> um, I have one for uh, Catherine, I believe it is. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what got you interested in um, being involved in the girls' government program? Um, well, a couple of years ago, I went to in to Ottawa in Parliament, so I kind of looked around and I thought it would be kind of cool to like actually find out more about it. And when I heard about this, I thought it would be fun to like learn more about it and see how it works and everything. Well, I think all of you guys presented uh, really well, especially. Um, the mat your maturity level is beyond what uh, I believe your ages are. So my next question is for, and I just want to make sure I get, is it Mercy? Uh, oh, sorry. You? I'm Sophie. Sophie. How did I get that wrong? I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, I guess I'm not writing fast enough for what Sherry was talking, but <laughs> it's okay. Sophie, right? Okay. Um, are you interested in any way in furthering um, any kind of employment in politics in the future? Yes, I'd say I am interested. Um, I don't know if I'd be like, I don't know if becoming an MP is necessarily what I would like to do, I'm not sure yet, but I'm definitely interested in this sort of thing, so I would definitely look into Like even what working I could do. alongside politicians or something yeah. like that? And Claire, Claire, um, in, in, through this program, what did you learn about uh, and how did you go about your research for your topic and, and about uh, the different social um, structures and, and uh, how did you go about finding out about all the information that you provided us? Well, originally I didn't know much about the First Nations communities and then so and then we chose the topic. So I went home and then I did all the research and I realized how like poorly the communities sometimes are. And cuz there's there's some communities that are more like third world countries, but I did a lot of research like um just using the internet and stuff, First Nations websites and also like news websites and stuff. So just going through what people had to say and there was many websites that said contrasting things to each other. So then trying to figure out like which one was actually accurate and stuff. So yeah. how much time do you think compiling all this research together like roughly took you? Um, maybe in total about six hours. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, it's a lot to find stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Well that's great. It's a, a wealth of knowledge that you've all put together. Um, and my final question is um, 
how can you, in the future, apply what you've learned through this experience and taking that forward whether you decide to continue in politics or not? Um, well, I guess if you decide to continue in politics and you're wondering how to even further help the Aboriginals and their health care or just help them in general, um, you would be able to take what we know now and compare it to the future and see have we improved at all or do we still need to work on it or what do we need to work on now to use it in the future for further knowledge, I guess. Good answer. Well, thank you all. You guys did a great job.